Linda Romero, and as you've probably noticed, I am not actually in the room. And that's because I am here in Galway, Ireland. So it's apt, I suppose, that my talk for today be something similar. So this is a talk I call I Outsider. A while back, along with a great many game developers, I was watching the Sony PS4 launch event and listening to all the exciting new things that the console could apparently do. And it felt like, in fact, I knew all the cool kids were there because I was getting texts from a lot of my friends who were at the event. And I knew that some of my friends' games were even going to debut there, and so I was obviously really excited for them. And as I listened to Mark Cerny talk more, I ended up having this one overwhelming thought, and it was this, I should be there. And this thought morphed into another one, which is why <coughs> aren't I there? Now, the actual answer is because I chose not to go, but this didn't even occur to me. Rather, these were the things that occurred to me. I wasn't there because I didn't belong. And obviously, these thoughts are pretty negative. I didn't matter was another thought I had. Maybe it's because my work was trivial, or the one that bothered me the most, I was no longer relevant. And it's something you hear lobbed around by a lot of game developers when they're talking about other people. You know, what has he even done lately? Oh, lol. Well, Michelangelo died in 1564, and Picasso died in 1973. This is Orson Welles, he died in 1985. Georgia O'Keeffe died in 1986. Gary Gygax died in 2008. But I think we all agree that they mattered, and they mattered in a big way. In fact, Gygax and David Arneson, who has also since passed away, defined my life. And I think we'd agree that they mattered. All of these people are giants, and when we raise the question, what have they done for us lately, hello, lol, I can actually prove that they've done nothing because they're dead. Now, if I move on to people who have retired, here's Kathleen Booth. She's born in 1922. She's still alive. She created the first assembly language in 1950 and the first assembler. This here's Margaret Hamilton. She wrote the code for NASA that put people on the moon. Uh, she was born in 1936, and two years ago she was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. But when's the last time she put someone on the moon, ha, huh? well, in so many different fields, we recognize their contribution to their art form. But sometimes it's not always so in games. And so as I came back to this thought that I wasn't relevant, what I was really saying was I wasn't core. It was as if Mark Cerny in his kind and soft-spoken voice was saying to me, it's true, Brenda, you're a loser. No, Mark Cerny would actually never say that. He's a super nice guy. But it's because I wasn't on that platform. In fact, I wasn't on either of these platforms. I wasn't working on a mobile or a touch device. Uh, I wasn't working on something cool like VR or AR. Uh, I wasn't even working on something super badass for Steam. And I caught myself saying things like this, like, I wish I were working on a real game. And I didn't even know what I meant by that term, as if the Olympics or the World Cup were not a real game just because they didn't run on a PS4. And because none of this, what was happening at the show, was relevant to me at the time, I felt therefore that I was not relevant. Because this was my platform. The games I've been working on lately are what you might call board games. They're about difficult historical and social topics. This is a game that I will finish this year. It has 50,000 pieces. I think there are 5,000 left to go. Uh, and so, while I feel very much compelled to make games and put everything into them that I could, somehow, for reasons I couldn't figure out, it didn't feel real. This is probably the best-known game in this series, called Train. I suspect these feelings are common to all who try to make experimental, innovative work. Because we don't have something to compare it to. Somehow, it doesn't feel real. And therefore, I guess, I didn't feel real as a game developer. I suspect it's not just the experimenters <coughs> and innovators who feel this way. I think it's anybody who's outside the core space. When I first started feeling this way, in fact, I was making Facebook games, and we all know how people felt about those. 
but it's really anyone working outside the core space, whether it's in games for change, or free play, or education, or health. My most recent release is a game I made with my family called Gunman Taco Truck, and it was an absolute blast to make this game. And when I look at it compared to something like Overwatch, I feel absolutely out of my depth. And my most recent physical game is a game called Black Box. It's a single play, single player game. And I've already played it, and it's finished, never to be played again. What's inside that box there, that's the end game state. You're obviously looking at a reflection from the other wall. But you can see inside the box. And these are pictures of the game in play. I, I took pictures in multiple cities. Um, here's a picture from New York. When the last move had been made, I sealed the end game in a box. And I put everything that I had into that game. And it was largely autobiographical. I ended up entering Black Box into a competition. It's not a game, they told me. But it is, because I played it. And they replied, it's in a box. So are these, I said. It doesn't fit, it doesn't belong, it's more art than game. And I have to admit, I took that last one as a compliment. But it's not a game, they told me. It is outside our rules. I was an outsider. To me, development for the core market was the absolute center of the world. And if you were not in that absolute center of the world, it didn't matter. And when I told some of my core friends how I felt, they thought I was nuts. Like, you're living the dream, man. You get to make whatever the hell you want. It was as if we were staring at each other through a glass. The outsiders wanted in, and the insiders wanted out. I was really puzzled with my thoughts and both surprised and unsure of my feelings. And like, how did it get this way? And why am I thinking this way? And why do I want in anyway? Why the need for validation? And why the need for creative freedom? Why the self-doubt? And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that my story might be the story of every game developer. So this is me. I was born uh, heavily pixelated, as it turns out. Uh, I'm, I think I'm two or three in that picture, and I remember like, from a pretty early age, I didn't really fit in. Um, I was born into a family much older than me. My sister was 19 and my brother was 14. Now, my dad had passed away when I was really young. And I don't say this to say like I had some unhappy childhood. I, I didn't. You know, I, was, I was a pretty happy kid, and I still am. Um, at the time, we didn't have a lot of money. But I vividly remember my mom taking me to garage sales. So we would go out and she would give me a dime and with that dime I'd buy some board games. So I was about five um, and I would end up getting games that didn't have all the pieces because then I could get more things and they were cheap. So I would collect the different pieces and with those pieces I could make absolute magic. And I'd mix up games and I would do whatever I wanted with them. And then, when I was about 13 or 14, I learned how to code. Uh, it, to me, it was absolutely the greatest thing in the world. I would love to say that my friends felt the same way. Uh, they had comments and thoughts. They gave me unique nicknames. Um, and I didn't particularly care, uh, because to me, it was just an absolute blast doing what I was doing. I love to code, and I love making games. And when I was 13, I actually lost all my friends. So I'd like to tell you that we were fabulously wealthy and privileged children, and that we set sail for an around-the-world cruise with our eclectic wealthy parents, and things were catastrophically wrong, um, and then a shark showed up, and we were eaten by sharks, except this is absolutely a complete lie. Um, the truth is rather mundane. The reality is, is that there were three of us, and one of my friends took some liquor from her parents. Fearful of being punished, she blamed me instead. Unfortunately, the charge stuck, uh, and I became a literal outsider. Now, while a teenage girl losing all her friends absolutely broke me at the time, I did end up spending a lot of time with my machine and my imagination and games. I wrote. I became really comfortable with myself. So I guess you could say that I got my saving throw. 
as far as those other parents were concerned, it probably didn't help <laughs> that I had found the dynamic duo of D&D and Black Sabbath at the same time. By the age of 15, in 1981, I was in the game industry at Certec Software, and I had absolutely found home. Everyone knew what hit points were and why I needed more, um, and I think that's why I was so blown away by Stranger Things. I was an awkward, unpopular kid, like I think many of us were, and all of those kids felt like me, and they were going on adventures that I wanted to go on. At last, even though I felt different than everyone else, I felt like I was home. The more I talked with other game developers, the more I realized my story was a common one. But they were just like me. So I decided to ask some other game developers how they felt when they were young. This is David Goldfarb. He says, I was always more comfortable being a stranger than belonging, because I didn't understand belonging. Being an outsider meant I could look at the world as critically and deeply as I wanted. This is Richard Dansky with Red Storm. He says, I got beaten up in the coat closet in fourth grade while well, class was in session, if you can believe that. Bullying was not uncommon. And many of us were possessed, basically, driven by something outside of us and just compelled to make games. Happen to know this guy? He said, when I started to learn how to program, I became an outsider because no one around me understood what I was doing and I didn't want to do anything else. That's John Romero. My friend Adam Orth had this to say, I was deep into the world of music, games, comics, and D&D. It was super hard to exist socially when I cared so deeply for those things. I alienated myself further from the world when I began creating those things. And many of us were in some way unique among our friends. None of my female friends liked video games. They weren't into the things I was into, said Eve Eschenbacher. Kim McAuliffe says, none of my friends were into playing Nintendo, just their brothers. I felt the same way when I got into the industry. There were only five female developers that I knew of, and of those five, I'm all that's love. It's a troubling trend, and I see this happening in my own house. This is my daughter, Mesa. She's level 100 in WoW. She doesn't play as much now as she used to, uh, but she still loves games. But basically, her friends have no interest in it, and so they kind of push her away. But fortunately, she has me as a parent, so that won't work too well. Some of us were also what I will call movers. And it was a surprising category to me, mind you. I talked to a lot of different game developers, and many shared their experience about moving around a lot as a kid. Uh, this is Kim McAuliffe again. She said, I felt more at home in books than in the real world. I moved around a lot as a military kid, and friends were impermanent. Popularity was a concept I never quite grasped. And Laura Lynn McWilliams said, feeling like an outsider came naturally to me because my dad was career army. I lived in 10 different places from birth until I was 17. The worlds and stories I created were my only consistent friends throughout those years. And so there's normal people. And then there's us. In fact, Blizzard is directly calling to us, I feel, in this brand new recruiting video that they have. Let me play it for you here. We have this wonderful community within our company. We're just, we're just a bunch of geeks. I can openly be who I am in, in an office. I can live a life here. I feel like I can talk to anybody on the campus, whether I know them or not, and instantly have a connection. Just by being at work, I'm getting a lot of friend time, and is what it feels like. It's great to get to work with people that you value both inside and outside of work. There's an amazing mix of people here. In this video, I'm not trying to give Blizzard a free plug here, uh, but this recruiting video spoke so much to me because it wasn't about their games, but it was about their community. It was about people who had found the other people like them. And do I really need to call it out? Like, for starters, there's action figures. Um, and then we even have, like, more action figures. They have D&D &D and board games, uh, even more, just in case. Um, 
They also have cosplay. Uh, they have uh, people on small motorized things, because why not? They have corporate logos in Legos. Um, they have short and long range weapons and to spare just in case. Uh, I mean, it's, it's us. It's the sad normal people and then there's us. We were home at last. And so, at some point, we all made it here. And you'd think that a group of outsiders who'd been mocked, beaten up, and called names would be sympathetic to welcoming people. But no sooner than we had found home did the industry begin to divide itself up again. We had PC and console, casual or core, free to play or retail, and of course, the great holy war. And we splintered into a ton of little fragments, and instead of one industry, we were many, not to mention the 75 different divisions of indie and who fits where. Let me just give you one example. So we'll take a look at indies and publishers. It was absolutely a very real division. So if you wanted to develop for Nintendo a while ago, you had to have one key thing, an office. They'd do a Google Maps search on the place, and if it seemed residential, they'd ask for more details. They would ask for photos, thus meaning that these games, and a great many more, didn't qualify, because they were developed in a home and not in an office. And there were other things, like questions that rise during competitions and the like, further splintering our community. That's not an indie game. I remember somebody actually saying that to me, despite the fact that I was literally building a game with my hands on my kitchen table, having funded the entire game myself. And there really are secret groups within the game industry. This isn't the logo of those groups, and I can't show you the logo, which is why you see this one instead. The logo of the Skull and Bones, however, was a secret society for me. And in some sectors, it actually feels like war with some game developers calling each other out in public, something that was all but unheard of 10 years ago. More recently, I've actually started seeing things like this from several quarters, and with some suggesting that they're deliberately being blocked from even entering the game industry at all. And so they consider themselves outside the industry, wanting to tear it down, rather than actually wanting to get in. And I don't want to say that they're entirely wrong. There are actual pieces of shit in the game industry. But there is an absolute truth, and that's that you cannot be blocked from making games. You could have a hundred people tell you today that you can't make games and go home and make them tonight. Everybody is welcome in the game industry. The second you start making games, you are one of us. We are an industry formed of outsiders. Someone like us, like you, has already succeeded. And beyond the games industry, the games movement is even bigger than the industry itself. In the evenings and weekends, there's game jams at colleges, and someone somewhere right now is making their first game, not for money, but for love. And that's the thing that matters most to me. And sometimes an outsider among us succeeds, like I mean really, really succeeds. They supernova. And our reaction to this, to me, is one of the most puzzling traits. Here's how we sometimes handle profound game developer success. First, we get excited for the game, genuinely. Um, we play it, we love it. Uh, we watch the game enjoy critical success. Some time passes, and then we begin to trash most future efforts of said developer. They think they're so great. They're gonna sell out. Fuck you, insert any game developer you want. What the fuck have you done since then, huh? I think of the story of Phil Fish here. When I saw any in the movie, I completely identified with his single-minded and obsessive pursuit. To some, it might just be a game, but I got where he was coming from, and Phil left games. I think he's a really talented developer, and I think that's sad, obviously. The guy who made Flappy Bird also left games, and 
here there should be a picture of Peter Molyneux. Uh, but when I googled his name, this is what I got instead. Peter Molyneux lies. Don't believe his lies. Curiosity. You can do anything. And this is a guy who created a genre. Like anybody who's played populist was profoundly moved by what he had done. And what ends up happening is that our wisest and brightest become black holes, and they just keep to themselves. And so let me just define that. Well, let's say a game, dev a game dev black hole is an extremely successful developer, a keeper of knowledge that should be shared, but who keeps to themselves or hangs out with other black holes. Because to do otherwise is to invite unhappiness. So create a really good game, and you suck. As far as I can remember, it wasn't always this way. There was actually a time when we all found home and were excited to find one another. But increasingly, the insiders in the game industry actually wanted out, so I asked them why. These are the answers that I got. I crave the ability to make something of my own design. They point to games like Ridiculous Fishing, which they believe would never have been made at normal publishers. They say, I miss working on a whole game. The ability to create something entirely yourself or with a very small team means a lot. I created my board games all by myself and loved it and still work in a small team today. I need to make something different. And I think about games like that Dragon Cancer and the beautiful, yet profoundly difficult, story that it tells. You know, I go a step further and actually say as an industry that we need something different. I've been blown away by games like Inside or Beginner's Guide, Night in the Woods, um, and Edith Finch. I mean, what remains of Edith Finch? This is, this is the first game that when I finished it, I just leaned back and started to cry. And I didn't start to cry because there's, I don't know, something at the ending, but rather it was just the most beautiful game that I had ever played start to finish, and I knew I was seeing the work of a master. You could really feel the love in that game. And maybe some people who come into games hope for riches that total independence can bring. And that's not wrong, because games can make people very wealthy. But there's this weird thing with it. Like in any other creative field, our best and brightest game developers can live off their royalties. But very few game developers get royalties. After making games that make millions, some game developers can barely afford to make rent. And those leaving are not alone. This year, I've known many leads and others in positions of power who are going out on their own. And some do it actually while they're still inside the company, just making games on their own time at night. Most game companies forbid people from making games while they're employed by another company. So there's really two ways that people get around this. One is they go purely stealth and they make games under a pseudonym. And the other is the famous Appendix A. You can cross stuff out in your contract, you can add an appendix saying you're working on other things. I think there's a way to do both, to keep your passion alive. The industry is absolutely full of it. And I also found, as much as insiders wanted out, outsiders wanted in. And so I asked them why, and here's what they had to say. I'm often alone. I create the security of a team and a paycheck. And so they would get a day job coding pretty much anything, or maybe not even coding, but by night, that's what they were working on. They were absolutely working on games. And eventually, they might even end up quitting that job and just working solo. And when they were working solo, the one thing <coughs> they said they missed was the security of a team. And when I asked about why, what was so important about the team, this is one of the answers that I got. It's about isolation. I need validation before I launch. Am I making something innovative or is it shit? And we want to talk to others that are like us. I mean, this became very apparent for me when I was really young. 
And I was interested in a ton of different things. D&D, &D, Sabbath, coding, board games. And none of my friends really cared about that. And for me, it's still that way. I want to talk to people who are like me. Most of my friends are game developers. And I think that's true of many of us. I work to maintain my relationships with game developers, even when I'm not in a game development community. I use Skype, whether it's in person, at conferences, Twitter, Facebook, and possibly secret societies. It feels like home. And hopefully we all make it here, everybody who wants into game development. I mean, if you look at the Twitter or Facebook feed or whatever of people who are at major game development conferences like this one, you'll often see that they're not so much talking about the talks or about the expo or other things like that. They're talking about their friends. They're talking about being in this great community. They're talking about, well, feeling like home and like they're a part of something that's bigger than just themselves. I started this talk with a particular person, and that's Jackson Pollock, you see pictured here. For me, it was necessary to look for inspiration and validation outside the game industry. I'm not sure when I first became aware of Jackson Pollock, and I'm not sure that my opinion, honestly, was a very good one. I mean, I think we've all heard things about Jackson Pollock. People often make fun of him. Rubber boots and elf shoes. And here's somebody's Jackson Pollock sneakers. There's kind of a weird accident that I don't understand, uh, but clearly involving a lot of paint and was compared to Jackson Pollock. Here's a Jackson Pollock chair. And Jackson Pollock also makes appearances on the runway in this particular outfit and in backpacks. My personal favorite, however, is the Action Jackson painting set for kids. <laughs> and last, here's some fingernails, also compared to Jackson Pollock. And you get the point. And the thing about all of these is that they lack the beauty, the intensity, the precision, the clarity of a true Pollock. I've seen a bunch of them at this point in time. And a real Pollock absolutely blows me away. See, to me, man, Pollock was the paint. He elevated and isolated it. He was in the medium and as close to the metal as he could get. In a sense, he reminds me of a level designer. I mean, you can actually see him going over and over and over the canvas, building it up and making it into something he wants it to be. And that's how any good level is made. In Pollock, sure, he didn't give us paintings of houses and angels and whatever. But he did give us action. And with Pollock, the paint is absolutely alive. Pollock, to me, is as pure as it gets. And he's also alone. Pollock's drip paintings were decidedly unconventional. I mean, no one was doing anything close to what he was doing. And he faced harsh criticism from his contemporaries and from critics. So in Time Magazine, Bruno Alferi said, it is easy to detect the following things in all of his paintings. Chaos, absolute lack of harmony, complete lack of structural organization, total absence of technique, however rudimentary. Once again, chaos. To which Pollock replied, no chaos, damn it. And although he had a great many supporters, including Peggy Guggenheim, it was the negative voices that he listened to the most. He never felt secure in his work. And at the height of his career, Life magazine in 1949 recognized Pollock. And they asked this question, is he the greatest living painter in the United States? And it was a tremendous compliment. And just imagine if somebody said that about you. Is she the greatest? artist? Is she the greatest programmer? Is she the greatest game designer? You'd be absolutely over the moon. But then think if they were talking about somebody else and they said, is he the greatest programmer? And you might think of reasons why they're not. And so this created this entire drama in the art world about how good Jackson Pollock was and people were questioning the style that he just wanted to paint. He didn't want it questioned. And at the height of his career, 
even though he was getting all kinds of praise and respect, what Pollock was really hearing was the criticism and derision, and it seemed so much bigger. And so, at the peak of his fame, he abandoned his style. Pollock's alcoholism worsened, and within six years, he dies. From the darkest period of my life came a series of games that were different, to say the least. In fact, I first spoke about these games here at this very conference. And in the back of the room, there was a reporter, and the reporter for The Escapist. And they ended up writing an article about these games. And when they did that, games that I had intended to be private suddenly got out. And people said pretty bad things about it. They said, stop making games. Um, but a lot of people had nice things to say because people hadn't made documentary games before. But here's how I heard it. And as words started to get out, my detractors likewise seemed pretty loud. And Pollock felt about paint the way that I felt about game mechanics. And I was reminded that when he decided to abandon the thing he was really good at, he really loved, that it didn't matter what people thought about the games that I was making. What mattered is what I thought about the games that I was making. And so I think it's important to say that we need not abandon our style, even if we can't be at the PS4 launch event, or compare ourselves unfairly to friends who have budgets 90 times the size of ours, or who are making games for different reasons. We compare ourselves unfairly. I mean, the reality is, is that we've got our own star, and we're out here. And at one point in time, I felt as if we're, I were outside of games, instead of pushing the edge of the boundary to see where games can go. Pollock and artists like him tell me that it's okay to do that, and that I'm not missing anything. If anything, Jackson Pollock gives me inspiration. Um, it's okay to go and do what I want to do and to find my own validation there. In these last few years, I played games that I couldn't imagine playing. And they were all made by outsiders, whether it's some of the games I've mentioned, like Inside or Edith Finch. Every time somebody creates a new genre, every time somebody breaks the mold, it's the outsiders who are getting there first, finding that dark space in a very lit environment. And so if you feel like an outsider, good. It's probably because you're doing something right. It's probably because you are looking for games in places other people aren't looking. It's probably because you're willing to push the boundaries of this medium. And it's probably because maybe someday, if you keep pushing, you'll make something great. Thank you. And if we have time, uh, I will be live on the line. Let's hope the internet holds up and I can take some questions. So I'm getting the connection up now. I've been chatting with her. Hello, Brenda. Hey. I can't believe Skype's working for the first time. Yeah. <laughs> it never happens. It never happens. Well, you got the right guy on the job. Oh, wait. Did I say that blatant, blatant uh, plug there? Yeah, well, now it's going to crash. So. Yeah, there you go. All right, so you're in a room with uh, about 20 plus people? I 20 plus people. I'm putting my glasses on like this is going to make any difference. <laughs> well, you're in a room with one person. Well, two people, I guess we count John. He's next to me. Hey, John. Oh, that's cool. Hey, John. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, Brenda, how would you like to do this? Uh, well, I don't know. Like, at the end of a talk, generally, someone would say, hey, does anybody have any questions? And I hope you like the talk. Like, I, I, um, we decided to pre-record it. Uh, I did it last night, though, so it's kind of like a single thing. Well, what time did I finish? Like 3 o'clock in the morning or something. But we decided to do that just for fear that the internet itself wasn't going to stay functional. You've got a great, so 
Great connection here. I guess you're uh, calling for questions. So, do we have any out there? And if you do, let's let's come over here so that she can hear your question, if, if that's okay. Um, or you can just you can just repeat it if you want, John. Sure, sure. sure. Well, uh, just yell it out, I guess. <laughs> okay. So, um, hold on. Sorry. Sorry. All right. So when you are uh, you talked about like kind of how you get down to that funk, I guess, where you just kind of lose all motivation, lose all will to do anything. How do you get out of that, or how do you break out of that? Did you catch all that? No. So, yeah, right. if you can, I think probably sure, the best no thing problem. is to you repeat it, John, because you're the closest to the mic. Cool Thank beans. you. So the, uh, the question here is, when you get into the, the, uh, the depths of funk, no, like a depressive state. When you get into a yeah. depressive state, you kind of become apathetic to everything. So a depressive state, you're apathetic, and you don't really want to do anything. How do you get yourself out of that? Oh, man. Yeah, um, yeah I've actually been there before. Um, and it's usually as a result of me trying to do too much. Uh, so like, one of, the th one of the ways that I find myself there is I'm doing too much. And because I'm doing too much, I'm not doing any one thing as well as I possibly could. Um, and so I, that ends up making me, well, you know, it makes me feel like shit, I guess is the easiest way to say it. So one of the things I try to do is cut down the amount of stuff that I'm doing, um, which I know sounds maybe counterproductive because you're in a funk and you should be doing more, but sometimes the reason that I'm in a funk is because I'm doing too much. Um, I've also had that feeling before when I'm doing something that I just don't feel passionate about. Um, and if I don't feel passionate about it, but I'm trying to like force myself through it, I will, sometimes I'll take a break, like I'll ask myself, um, you know, is this a project that should be shelved? Like, do I, is this something that I need to finish, right? Um, and then there's other times when genuinely, like right now, I, you know, I teach, uh, I teach at a university in addition to having a full-time game development gig, which is just a bad role model, so don't follow that. Um, but sometimes I just feel uh, just really tired, and I'm just like, I just need to get to do the next thing. So some of the times when I do feel that way, I try to find things to get me out of that proverbial funk. Um, like, you know, watching talks from game designers that I really like, playing games that I think are just unbelievably beautiful or I try to make something really small that I know I can finish or feel good about. Um, and then I remember there was this one thing, and I can't say what it is, but it's in the current game I was working on. And I just this one system was trying to, to it felt like it was trying to fight me at every, at every possible, I don't know, every possible turn. Um, and I ended up cutting this, this thing that I was trying to make work. And when I did that, the whole thing just lightened up and got so much better. But it's usually, if I'm feeling down, it's usually because I've got too much going on um, or something that I'm doing is just not working right and I'm unwilling to let go of it. Um, usually I find uh, slowing down, letting go of that thing uh, helps. For me, that usually works. And sometimes it's just I'm tired and I just have to brute force my way through it knowing that it'll eventually change. Gotcha. And I've screwed up and got a dialogue box in front of your face, but we can still hear you just fine. Oh, Wait. no. Okay, well, that's fine. Yeah. We had another uh, question over here. Yes. Come on up. And actually, yeah, if you want to... Yeah, come up too, John. Sure. So, wave at the camera here. Hi. And Hello. come on over and ask your question. Um, yes, ma'am. I was curious about, you're mentioning how those who are on the inside, those who are in the big companies that a lot of outsiders are trying to get a part of. Um, do you imagine seeing in the future the industry changing and transforming from within to be able to be more inclusive or make it feel like home again? And if so, how would that, what might spark that change? And what might it look like? Hmm. You know, it's interesting. I. I kind of regret this now because I would have had a great story to tell. Uh, when I didn't do it, um, and I didn't do it because I felt like I'd make the guy feel bad. I, you know, so there's this part in, in this talk where I talk about Peter Molyneux. And someone today in a class that I was teaching sort of made fun of him. And I wanted to say, when's the last time you made a genre? 
Um, you know, we're we're all allowed. We're all allowed mistakes. Uh, and I think maybe it's people saying things like that. There there are places that the industry feels um, that the industry does feel more like a family. Like where I work now, I definitely have that feeling with everybody who's on the team. Um, in a way, you know, game development, it's an industry and it is big business, right? So I don't think we're ever going to not feel like big business, but the parts, well, not every place is going to feel that way. Um, but the parts that feel like a home, uh, the parts that feel like a home are when we go to conferences or we meet other people. Um, and I think especially if you get to a point where you can create your own company, then you can surround yourself with people that you know, you just feel absolutely great being around. And you know, that's how I feel now. I'm, you know, this is the best team by far that I've ever worked with. Uh, and it absolutely feels like home when I go there. Fabulous. Fabulous. Who else has a question? Come on up. That last approach worked well, so wave at the camera and come around and ask some questions. Um, so first, I love your talk. And it was mentioned uh, that for the outsiders, um, that we seek uh, this individual validation, um, and there are a bunch of quotes supporting that. Um, but where, for you, does that does that come from exactly? Like, where is that validation coming from? Um, hmm. I think so. At first, I think, especially with train, uh, and it was there. You know, it was in that conference that I first talked about it, and then a reporter was in the room and. Um, and I, you know, I, I wasn't worried about validation then because nobody was really going to know about these games that I was working on. Uh, and validation really goes, I guess, two ways. Like wanting to feel like what you're doing is okay. Um, I, I'm at a point, and I've seen that thing about senior designers, I'm at a point where what I'm doing I assume is not okay. I assume there's some, like some horrible third, third arm in it and hope my team will point out what that third arm is. Um, and usually, you know, I'm lucky that we are, that everybody in the, in the whole studio uh, likes the game, is playing the game, and so they have loads of opinion about the game. And as long as I don't say, no, that's a stupid idea and shut people down, then people will keep doing that. But in terms of like the weirder stuff that I make, um, the weirder stuff that I make is just a gut check, really. Um, and is it what I want to make? And I'm, you know, you ever, you know how they say like when people get older they just stop caring? They just stop caring what other people think? I'm at that point now. I think. <laughs> Where I just, like especially on the weirder stuff, um, there's this one game and I, and I haven't even had time to prototype or really think about prototyping it. I, it, it's, it's silly as it sounds, I started a prototype of it in Kino, as in like the PowerPoint-ish thing for uh, Mac. Uh, just see feeling how flow would go screen to screen. Um, and I don't particularly care if anybody likes it because it's the game that I want to tell, or it's the story that I want to tell. Um, and I, you know, I don't, I, I'm way past the point of like caring, especially these games, like if they're with a publisher, the, the validation is did you sell enough, right? Did you sell enough to be able to get yourself another contract? Um, but for the games that are sort of like what we'll call a passion project, like I just want to make the game, um, I guess my validation is do I feel I did as good a job as I think I could do? Because uh, some of the games, like especially Black Box, like I don't even talk about what that game is about, so I'm, I'm not going to find any validation for that game. But am I happy that I made it? Absolutely. So I've, I've gone to that, to, to that part, but for for the commercial games, you know, it's it's focus testing, and at the, the very earliest level, um, at the very earliest level, how do other people how do other people react to the game, and providing anonymous ways for them to give feedback if possible. But I usually assume that I'm that there's some ridiculous thing that I'm that I'm missing, which is fine because there always is, and you can't think of everything. Cool. Do we have others? Come on down. You're the next contestant, Don. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know which win, but you're the next contestant. Look under your seats. <laughs> 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 Never <laughs> 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 Hey, 
Okay, so um, this is kind of a follow-up question to what someone had brought up earlier, uh, talking about being in that sort of rut about, uh, uh, in your case, you mentioned how uh, it's from being, trying to do too many things at once. Uh, I uh, am one of those people that are kind of on the opposite end of where I want to try and get stuff started but I often struggle to try and find the motivation to bring myself forward to do it. And I was wondering if you could uh, offer any ideas of what could be a good way to bring yourself forward. Um, hmm. It depends. Like, it depends whether you're talking the carriage or the stick, right? Like, what are the possible ways to bring yourself forward? Um, so on, on the carrot side, or I guess just on the company side, like the, the having company around you, is committing like committing to do, say, a game a month or treating it a little bit like a job. Every Saturday from 4 to 8, you are going to be working on something and that's it. So putting a bit of discipline to it. And then maybe even looking at like, what is the, what is the fear, like is there a fear associated with it? Like if you, are you taking on, are you trying to make Chrono Trigger? right out of the gate, or Overwatch, or something that's just too big, instead of making something much smaller, where there's where it's not really about success or fail, but just getting it done. Um, doing things that are that are game jammy with other people has a sense of community that often pushes you to get things finished. Um, on, the, on the stick side is asking, you know, how many, um, for me, uh, I, you know, I don't know what happened with 350, but I have this, like, I want to finish stuff. And realizing that every game I make is zero sum. Uh, or every year I have left is zero sum. Like, I can only make so many games between now and, and whenever, I don't know, whenever. I don't know when I'll ever stop. There's no time I'll ever stop making games. But I only have so much time left, and so I want to use that time wisely and get as much done as I conceivably can in that time. So that's the stick. Like, if I'm not doing it now, what am I going to expect to do it when I'm 81? You know, maybe, like, but I, you know, I, would, I hope I'll be, um, I hope at least I'll get through my Steam playlist from 81 to 91. <laughs> Excellent. How about others? Come on up. Don't be shy. Wake up the day. Hello. Try to broadcast your voice. Yeah, Brenda, thanks for the talk. That was great. Um, I was going to ask, uh, so a lot of the stuff you've done, uh, like Black Box, for example, is very, very personal stuff, very uh, stuff that you've done kind of for, your, for yourself. Um, but, uh, you know, for me, and I feel like for a lot of people, a lot of what I make games for is, is to share it also. So can you talk a little bit about what it's like to share things that are so personal? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, Black Box, I haven't talked to, with, to anybody about what that's about. Um, but I, but the other games, like Train, uh, sharing that was really, uh, so I don't know that, it, this is funny that it was that it was at this very conference that I talked about it, because I'm, you know, talking about a game at the time that was in a whole series of games that were about things at the time, people absolutely did not make, make games about these things. Um, and I remember when uh, the escapist, because there was a reporter in the room, um, there was a woman in the front of the room, uh, Amanda, and she started to cry. She left and she came back and you know, she gave me a big hug and said she really liked to talk. And, and you know, I'm still funny enough, I'm still in contact with her today. But I remember that this whole series was very personal to me to see if I could do it. And when the article got out and there was the reaction to it, because you should stop making games, I thought, oh my god, like, am I going to get kicked out of the game? Not that you can be kicked out of the game industry, but <laughs> like, have I just destroyed, I don't know, I don't know what I thought I destroyed, but I remember calling John just so upset. Um, and actually the quote that's in the, the talk was actually from him saying like, Man, you're doing you're doing what everybody wishes they could do. You you know you're making games. You're making the games that you want to make. Um, you know without any commercial anything. Um, making so that just because those games were very personal to me. Having that out there uh, was I don't know. It was kind of uh, I mean it felt like in, in a way being being naked walking down the street. Um, Black box. I don't think uh, I don't think I'll talk about what the game is about. Um, you know, and that's that's just a personal choice. And I think 
games are, they have to become more increasingly autobiographical, right? Um, I mean, just because of the nature of stories that we're telling at this point. Like, people are, uh, I mentioned a few a few stories in there that, I, that I've recently played and really liked. And I, and there's, there's other topics, like, I don't know if you guys have played Florence. It's a, it's a game on, um, I don't know what else it's on, but it's on the mobile phone. It, it's on any smartphone. It's on Android, iOS. Um, and that game's a really personal game, and I don't know what to extent that is autobiographical. Um, but yes, you know, sometimes I gave, I guess the places that I share the most personal stuff um, are in talks, funny enough. Like this one I gave called Prototyping a Tragedy. And I thought everybody hated the talk because nobody come, came to talk to me after the talk. Like everybody just left. Um, and then, and then I saw the feedback, and you know that's not why they did that. But I don't know. I don't know how it feels. Like I do it in talks. Um, if people knew what black box, I wouldn't. I'm just not comfortable talking about what black box is about. But I'm glad I made it. Um, so the answer, the very, the actual answer to the question is probably I don't know. Because I don't know if I've done it in such an open way, um, but you know, anytime you make any game at all whatsoever, you put yourself out there. And if the game does well, then great. And if the game doesn't do well, then it's usually the designer that takes it in the face, and you have to own that. Like not every one of my games has been great. Um, no, no designer that I know of has had you know a, a string of hits. I mean, you know, like there's somebody I know who made Wolfenstein 3D, Doom, and Quake, and then Daikatana, right? Like, not everybody <laughs> gets a string of hits, but I would take 12 Daikatanas on my resume if I could still have Doom and Quake. Nice. I just settle for Doom, in fact. That would be good enough for me. So I'll note two things. This is your your host here. Uh, one is uh, in your talk, you told us that we couldn't get kicked out of the game industry, so uh, so we're not too worried about that, right, guys? But, um, the other thing that I'll say is is the fact that you made Black Box and and you are sharing that you made that Black Box is also sort of a sharing of a game, even though you're not going into the details and we don't want to ask of those, but we do acknowledge the intrigue and the mystery and all of that, and that's actually worthwhile as well. You know what was cool about, um, a thing about Black Box that I thought was interesting, I. I had it set up at this place where I did, um, and it wasn't finished at the time, but I had it, the game, the play wasn't finished at the time, but I had it set up, um, partially set up, and well, where the end game state was was set up, it wasn't an end game, where the game state was, what I'm trying to say, was set up, and two people saw it, and it was a board game, I invited a bunch of board game designers over, and they were all talking about their, their stuff to students, um, the games that they had made. And so I got an email from two different people who were at the event who were at, who were board game designers and who said that Black Box really spoke to them. They talked about why. They talked about what they thought it was about. They were sure that they knew what it was about. Uh, they were both wrong. But nonetheless, because they saw something in it that, you know, if people don't know what something is, they'll try to read into something. And the only place that they can come up with ideas is, you know, obviously through their own experience. So even though both of them were not right about what Black Box was, they both had an experience that to them was in some way meaningful based on their own experience. And I thought that was, I thought that was really cool. I didn't tell both of them that they were, were wrong. Um, I just had said, thanks so much for sharing that with me. I'm glad you came and then changed the subject to something else. But in their head, they have two, two different versions of Black Box. Cool. Uh, we're at the five minute mark. Anybody have any other questions? Got one back there? All right, so come on down. Quick. Oh, quick. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Wait. We'll get the we'll get the last one in as well, and that'll be it. So what? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, just just um, to be a fanboy, I saw that earlier talk. It's been a long time, um, and I just. Um, I uh, very much admired those games, those private games that you told about, that you just discussed in that talk, and uh, I just wanted to ask you, because this question just came into my mind, has something to do with my mom, um, do you know of a game which is about dementia? I know, I know games that have been created uh, created to help people with dementia. Yeah, I know, I, I know of that. I'm, I'm asking more, yeah, about, I... more about something like Train. 
Do you know that? Blade has a new replay character that has mental issues. Yeah, yeah but not. I don't, you know, which which immediately makes me think you should make one. To Spark, I nothing more to say about that. I just really wanted to, to uh, thank you for this talk and the connection to the other one. And you were you were at that other talk? Yeah, I was there. Oh wow. Mm -hmm. Well thank you know like that it's 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 because, funny enough, like it's because of that talk and whoever invited me to talk about it there, which I, you know, I guess was the, the, the group and the, the reception that that talk got. I mean, they mentioned one of the reasons, which who would have thought this would have happened, but one of the reasons that I got a BAFTA was because of those games. Mm. Um, yeah, so, you know, if you were at that talk, you were part of that reception, so thank you for that. Yeah, and thank you. Come on down. You know the drill, wave at the camera. And <laughs> <laughs> sleeping baby. Yep. Um, so my uh, so my, my question was um, thinking about like insiders and, and outsiders. Um, so how how do you explain to you like family or people that knew you before you kind of dove into games? Like what it is that drives you to to make them and um, like yeah like sorry like how to explain to them like why it's so important to you but you, they don't really have a frame of reference for it. Yeah, that's really tough, isn't it? Um, how do I explain? So I I don't think you know and I'll and I'm sort of I'll tell a bit of John's story here as well. Like I don't know that my family really got it. Right? They, really, they didn't really get it and get how interesting games could be until there was a game that was interesting to them. Like, for my niece, it was Farmville. And that's when I knew things had really changed. That She asked me if she could add me in Farmville. Um, and when I was younger, I remember people saying, when I started playing d and um, saying, that's when I got weird. You know, and like anybody who's my age being called a nerd or a geek or playing D&D, &D, you know, we really, I felt very much like sort of part of the loser's club. Um, I've, I think, I, you know, I can describe to people, I've tried to describe it in ways that make them understand it. That just imagine if you could, you know, standing in the room, imagine if you could turn this room into anything. Imagine if you could have any experience you wanted to have. Imagine if you could make a movie that you've always wanted to see. Because you try to use something that, something, some form of art that they would get that fits their frame of reference. Um, and sometimes that itself doesn't work. Like John's mom, um, what year, 2015, was it? She went to GBC? Yeah. Yeah, John's mom went to GBC in 2015 for the first time. She never, had never been to a GBC or anything. And she said to me, she said to me, like, so all these people know who Johnny is? Um, and she was just super surprised, you know? Super surprised that a whole room full of people were coming to hear him talk about his game. You know, but, but Doom is an old game, and why would all these people want to know about it? And just, you know, it just kind of didn't, didn't get it. And when for her, when for her, her big moment was when his game got in the Smithsonian, because the Smithsonian was something she could understand what that was. I mean, I'm not. I'm making her sound dumb, right? She's she's a super smart woman, but games just are not. At least, at least video games just are not part of her world, really. And she didn't understand just how huge they had become. Um, so you know, I I don't know. Like I uh, I've often described my passion for games is it's not a like it's not something that I. Um, it's not something that I enjoy, that I just enjoy doing, and so hey, I made a living out of it. I really describe it like it was a calling. Like some people may have got a calling to be teachers, to the priesthood, and for whatever reason, I get a D20, and <laughs> and that's what I explain to people. And it, they might not get it, but if they have a similar passion, if they love knitting or quilting or whatever it might be, that's how I feel about games. It is absolutely all-consuming to me. Um, you know, my like my kids are gamers. My husband's a gamer. You know, we John and I talk about game development constantly. Talk about game ideas constantly. So, you know, I don't know. I just try. There's I don't know if there's really a way to do it because we're kind of still carrying some baggage around from like oh games, trivial games. Um, you know, but I would love I kind of love to be able to make a game that made me feel like Edith Finch made me feel. I'd love to be able to do that. That's 
That's my current high water mark right there. Beautiful game. Right. Thank you. Brilliant. Well, that's our time, Brenda. And John is back now. Um, we, we all want to uh, give you a big round of applause for the time that you spent here and the message that you've given and all that you've contributed to the industry. I, I think I speak for all of us that, that it's affected all of us greatly. So thank you very much. Thank you.